Hi, Chris Chernohoy at the University of Wisconsin River Falls Music Department. You are in lovely Abbott Concert Hall, and we're hosting we are hosting a very, very fantastic singer with us today, Jack Swanson. Jack hails from Stillwater, Minnesota. I have had the honor to watch him grow up. <laughs> yeah, I know his parents very, very well, his family, and it has been an honor to watch his career catapult from high school all the way to even at a young age, I won't even, I probably shouldn't say your age, but 28 <laughs> years old, right? Yeah. 28 years old and already traveling the world and in demand as a tenor. So welcome. Thank you, it's good to be here. What a treat. Thanks for having me. It's so fun to have you here. <laughs> so Jack, you have had an amazing, fast rise to the top in your career. There was one performance perhaps or role in Los Angeles that kind of changed your life. Would you please talk about that? Yeah, yeah, it changed my life in a lot of ways actually, which I'm sure you'll hear uh, when my lovely wife comes on. But uh, yeah, actually, so I went to University of Oklahoma for my undergrad, then went to Rice University for my master's degree in Houston. And when I got done with school, I was kind of faced with those challenges that all the singers are. It's like, what do we do now? All we're used to is school, our standard voice lessons, you know, having the school production. And um, luckily I had a summer where I went to Santa Fe Opera. And um, at Santa Fe is where I actually met my, my manager who heard me sing. And a manager in opera is kind of the person that reaches out to other opera companies and says, hey, you should use my guy. And, and he signed me on um, right when I finished at Rice. And so LA Opera um, was actually one of the opera companies that I auditioned for their young artist program. So for opera singers, what we do after school or what a lot of people do is they join a young artist program where they keep getting their lessons, they do smaller roles in some of the operas, they do a lot of language coaching, all of this type of stuff. And uh, I auditioned for LA Opera right out of school and did not get into their young artist program. And I was really disappointed because my teacher taught there and I had some friends that were going there. And I was like, well, I guess, you know, I'll go back to Stillwater and drive Uber for a little bit. And uh, that was my plan. And uh, then LA Opera calls me just maybe six, seven months later and said, We'd actually like you to uh, be in our show Candide by Leonard Bernstein. And we'd like you to play the role of Candide. And I was like, wow, all right, this sounds awesome. And it turns out Kelsey Grammer is going to be in the show and Christine Ebersol. And um, it was really a dream. I went out there, did those performances. And then since then, I've done a few Candides. I've done a few different roles. And it was really a great experience. When you got out to L.A., what did they use for promotion? <laughs> well, they used a lot for promotion. On all the signs, the names are always Kelsey Grammer, Christine Ebersol. But the picture was a headshot of mine, actually, that they changed into a picture where they added some heart sunglasses and made it very Candide-esque. And uh, so it was pretty fun. I was When I first showed up in L.A. and was driving to the opera house, I looked and I was like, that's my face. That's my face. That's pretty cool. <laughs> they manipulated it, but that's my face. Yeah, it was pretty fun. So tell us about Candide and how you connect with that role. Sure. So, um, you know, I didn't really know the show until I really started learning it and singing it. I'd heard certain things from it. There's a very famous soprano aria from it called Glitter and Be Gay, which is done a lot. And so I'd heard that piece. But I really didn't know much of the music for Candide or any of the big ensembles. And when I started learning it, the first thing I thought was, oh, this is Bernstein, West Side Story, you know, one of my favorite musicals. And um, I have to say now, I think I enjoy the music from Candide even more than West Side Story. They're, they're both amazing musicals or operas or whatever you want to call them. He, Bernstein said Candide was an opera, West Side Story is a musical, but... They're both similar in a lot of ways. Um, so, I mean, I really connected to the character, the opera, the music. I loved the the story. I loved the each of the roles had a very specific um, part to the story. And the big thing about that piece is by the end of the night, the audience really does feel like they've learned something. It's one of those shows where you leave and you're like, 
wow, this is so pertainable to my own life. And when you can go and see a show like that and leave, you know, either feeling changed or reflective, that to me is when theater can really, you know, strike home and be a really great thing. So I've, I've, I love Candide, one of my favorite shows. And it's great to work on it in L.A. That's fantastic. You've mentioned something already that makes, I think, you a little bit unique in the world of opera. And that is you also get just as excited and fired up and embrace musical theater. Yes, yes. I, uh, you know, when I first started getting into the singing thing, um, well, I was always, you know, I'm from Minnesota, so the choral tradition is a, is a big thing. And uh, I, I think I was in my junior year at Stillwater High School, and my choir director said, why don't you start taking voice lessons? And so I'm like, sure, why not? I start taking with this guy um, from Stillwater. His name's Obed Flown. He's still in the area. He's running an opera company in Stillwater now. And um, we, when I first showed up, I said, okay, this is what I want to learn. I want to do all the West Side Story, all the musical, you know, that was my favorite stuff, the Disney songs. And um, so that was definitely the first love of, you know, theater and show for me. My family always grew up going to Lion King and Andrew Lloyd Webber shows. And so uh, we definitely started with that. But then he was like, hey, I just want to try some stuff with you here. I really think your your voice would work well in some of this other uh, repertoire. And so I said, OK, that sounds kind of boring, but I'll give it a shot. And um, he, the, the big switch for me was when he had me go home and listen to Luciano Pavarotti singing Vesti La Juba from Pagliacci. I went home and I had just got these new headphones for Christmas. I put them on and I could not stop just rewinding this amazing moment in this song. And uh, from that point on, I was just hooked. I had the opera bug. I was like, this is what I want to sound like. This is what I want to do. And and that was that. But I also still love to sing musical theater. Yes, I, it's still a, a passion. It's just opera, once you get into it, can kind of become all-consuming. <laughs> and how can it become all-consuming? Is it because of the depth? Is it because of the history? Is it because of the networking and the taxing and the challenges that it takes to really pull it off? I would say that's part of it, man. Definitely the networking and the, uh, I mean, I like to tell people when you're in the performing field and particularly the singing field, you can still, I mean, I think it's a really good thing to be flexible and be able to do this and sing this type of repertoire and sing, you know, Bernstein one day and Rossini the next day. I think it's, really good to do that um however like to actually get a career in the sense of kind of climbing a ladder is what i like to say um you really have to focus on what people what you sing and people go wow that's i haven't heard someone do it like that before or you know it kind of keeps bringing you to the next so you really have to hone in on that one thing that makes you stand out in that repertoire from other people. And in opera, there are so many different composers and different types of songs and music and um, that you can focus on. And if you kind of stray away from that too often, it's, it's hard to stay on that straight and narrow path of, you know, singing it at bigger houses, singing it with bigger conductors, bigger orchestras. And um, that was the advice I got. And, you know, I sing the musical theater stuff and I, I do it when I'm home and for fun and for friends and family and sometimes for shows. But uh, in general, I, I did kind of stick down that opera path and still on it. So. And, you, and you also, when you say that you did take their advice, and so you are known as, as, an, as a tenor, and who are the composers and what are the shows that are just in your wheelhouse? Sure. So um, a lot of what I sing is um, Rossini's operas. Um, in general, he is... They actually, there are actually singers that are known as Rossini singers. Rossini tenors are a big thing. Um, he wrote extremely challenging music that is both high and fast and just challenging to learn the patterns. And so if you're a singer that, that comes a little bit more naturally, uh, it's one that's good to kind of hook into right away because everybody does Barbara Seville, Everybody does um, Cenerentola, which is Cinderella in Italian. 
um, they're just really popular operas to be done. So if it's something that you sing and feel like you sing well, uh, that's something to stick with because every opera company is going to be doing those shows. Um, so Rossini, and then the other one that I feel like feels like home for me is Mozart. Um, I sing a lot of Mozart's music, and although I haven't done a lot of the big roles yet, I sing a lot of the art songs that he has, the concert arias that he's done, and um, yeah, so those are kind of the two composers I'd say I, I fit into the best at, at this time. And when you say that you still have a manager mm -hmm. and you still work with your teacher. Yes. So Actually, what, I just did today. Did so, you, yep. We so did how, FaceTime. Did you Zoom your FaceTime? Yeah, we did a FaceTime lesson. So, so. Tell, tell me about that because um, you're, ne like you're doing so well in your career, but you also know that at all ages you need your coach, you need guidance. Um, yeah. Because yeah. what would happen if you did a role that wasn't appropriate for you? A lot of bad stuff. No. Yeah, <laughs> think, for you know, sure. The training, the training never ends um, for a musician. And, and I mean, obviously I know for a singer, I've seen it, you know, in friends of mine and, and people that I know who kind of go, yeah, I've got the, I've, I'm too busy. I've got this going on and kind of stray away from just getting better and better at their technique, at their languages, at their, you know, what type of repertoire they should be singing. Um, most singers that I know kind of have a little family or a group, um, that tells them that it's kind of like their their circle is what they call it like their opera bubble circle that if a role comes up and you're not quite sure if you should be singing it and that sometimes that depends on where if it's a big house if it's a small house if it's a big orchestra who else is singing um those type of questions are the ones that you need to go to your voice teacher your coach your mentor from school and just trust their opinion and i mean i always say if if more than one of those four people say, eh, I don't know, then really take their advice. And, and even if that means saying no to a job that you're free for and money and all these things, you're, uh, you're probably better off just turning it down for now. And, and the thing is, opera companies res respect that. They say, oh, well, that actually means a lot to us that you wouldn't want to come and do something that you don't feel ready to do. And uh, they'll come if they if they want to hire you, they'll come back with something that's better for you. But, so, so speaking of the opera companies and the commitments that you've had, you were supposed to be in Santa Fe this summer. Yeah. I had reservations. Oh, <laughs> I yeah. would have been down there um, for the chamber music and the opera oh, sure, because yeah. it's a beautiful, beautiful thing, isn't yep. it? Yep. And so um, that was canceled, like many other things. And rather yep. than focusing on what wasn't, let's talk about what is happening for you this fall. Sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, when everything shut down, I was actually in Minneapolis doing um, a world premiere of Paolo Pristini's Edward Tulane. That was canceled about 10 days before it was supposed to open. Uh, then I was supposed to go down to Colorado and do a show. It was canceled. Then Santa Fe, Barbara Seville was canceled. And by that time, I was kind of like, okay, this is supposed to be a three months of work for me. <laughs> and... Um, so I decided, you know, I got to keep singing. I got to do something. So I took on a lot of projects that I've wanted to do um, and just haven't had time for. And what a better time to, you know, do that when we have all the time in the world sitting at home. So I, uh, I pulled out a lot of this repertoire that I knew I'd wanted to record and sing. And I ended up making a virtual recital with a videographer team in Minneapolis and a sound engineer in Minneapolis. And... We're in the process of editing and finishing it up, but it's a really cool project that I'm really excited about. And it has taken about two months of my time just in in marketing and in you know all these skills that I didn't really have before. So it, it's been really fun to work on that. But uh, now it's kind of time to get back in shape. I'm leaving for Germany in three weeks. Hopefully if everything stays the same, I just kind of need a letter that says, hey, he's going to work here. So. I go to Germany to do a recital in the beginning of October, and then I fly from Germany to Oslo, Norway, where I'll be doing Barbara Seville with them until New Year's Eve. So that's that's the next next thing here. What a wonderful thing! Yeah, I'm I'm really fortunate that um, a lot of my work this year was based over there, and they're you know seeming to do it another way. <laughs> They're figuring yeah. it out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> figuring out how to make a difference. Yep. What would you like to be known as? 
think a lot of things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, I would say number one would be a good colleague. Um, you know, I've I've now been singing and performing for the last three or four years um, with some of the, I mean, some are the greatest singers in the world. Some are not the greatest singers in the world, but amazing on stage or all these things. And the thing that I found that's really important is that being a good colleague and a good person to the people you're working with is really uh, number one. And and then all the other stuff is also important. But um, I think I think that would be, you know, my number one goal is by the end of this that people said, oh, we just love working with this person, no matter no matter what they bring to the table, you know, and hopefully I'm bringing good stuff to the table. But um, but that would be number one, I would say, in my book. I really like that answer, and uh, that's one of the things that attracts me to uh, the energy that you bring everywhere that you go. You're very Thank grounded, you. dedicated, and yet kind, and the attitude that every single person matters and every situation is one we can learn from mm -hmm. is the one that will take you for a long, long uh, career and life and hopefully one of joy. Thank you. So that's very important. How do you motivate yourself to practice? You're talking about the roles, the languages. Yeah. You know, we've been, you know, the roadblocks are there. Everywhere you turn, there's a brick wall similar to these. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so how do you motivate yourself to keep learning, growing, and making a difference? That's a very good question. Um, you know, I think I motivate myself to sing and practice and work on all these things. I think there are a lot of reasons to do it. I mean, one practical reason would be, if I don't get it done and I show up, I'm fired. <laughs> so, I mean, that would be part of it. But um, it's kind of like like practicing and, and working out. And it, it, I'm saying they're kind of similar. Doing like, like, okay, I hate going to the gym sometimes. I don't want to just go sing for an hour right now. But when you do and you get done, it feels really good. And um, when I realize, oh, I haven't sung in a couple of days. I need to work on this. And then I kind of put my head to the grindstone and start singing. Um, I realized like 20 minutes after I'm done is like the happiest I've been all week or all day. So, um, that, I mean, that's a, I think a good sign for me at this point is that when I'm done singing, I'm, I'm happy. So knowing that that will be there by the end of the session is a good motivation to, to sing and practice. And, um, but then obviously the practical one is nobody, nobody really want respects the person who shows up and is like wasting other people's time with not being prepared like the you know you show up and you go like oh they don't they're not singing this part and i spent two months doing this you know so that's that's a big motivation as well you never want to be the person just caught and like uh oh <laughs> so that discipline is getting you far well i, I hope so i hope other people feel that way at least <laughs> what advice do you give to singers and musicians who aspire to be better and to have a routine and discipline. Hmm. What advice? I mean, I think the the important part is to not lose um, the the joy that obviously was the reason you started doing it. Probably, I mean, when you were however whatever age you started pursuing your singing or your your craft, your, your piano playing, like that at the time that started, it obviously was something that you really loved and enjoyed. So don't let the, the, you know, rejection and the things make it become a bitter, sad thing, or there's really no reason to do it. Um, I've, I've found that if I'm watching somebody who's performing and I can tell that they're just kind of going through the motions, even if it sounds great, even if it's technically flawless. Um, you know, you know, you know if they're loving it or not. So I think that's my biggest advice would just be take a step back and realize and, and think about why you might still love what you do. It is an honor to love what you do it really is and to yeah. be good at what you do and everybody can make a difference if they choose to use whatever level of gifts they have that's right and it's been an honor to work with you uh for the original or the debut of the opera on the river yep we uh put together a 
local, if you will, regional orchestra to, to get through and to get that catapulted. And now you've got to the point where we can have a, a union orchestra, which yeah. is wonderful, absolutely fantastic. And that was first class. And so that was a creative way to do really it. It was a really fun, fun project. It's fun to work on. And, you know, it always just, you keep climbing, you figure things out. And that's the other thing. I mean, again, like if you, the rejection or the stumbles or whatever, like that's just got to make you stronger and go, okay, now I need, now I know what I need to do the next time. And learning. Uh, it's yeah. a learning totally. forever. And we never quit learning. I hope we, I hope we never quit learning. I hope, I hope not either. Well, thank you for sharing <laughs> your time and your talent. We look forward to your music. Thanks for having me.